We falsely think of our country as a democracy when it has evolved into a mediaocracy, where a media that is supposed to check political abuse is part of the political abuse. These commercial entities now vie with the government for authority over our lives. They are not a healthy counterweight to government. They are as big as or bigger than government, and they work closely with government. The most powerful special interest in Washington today is the media, because not only do they give money and lobby and do all the things that industries do in Washington and companies do, but they of course control whether or not a politician's mug gets on the tube. Now that's power. <laughs> that's the ultimate power in a, in a political realm is, is controlling perceptions. In George Orwell's novel 1984, Winston Smith worked at the Ministry of Truth, but his job was not to ensure that truth was preserved. Quite the contrary. His job was to alter past news stories so that the version of the truth given by the ruling elite, the party, was never contradicted. If the party, which Orwell called Big Brother, lied to the people, a quick check of Winston's altered records, the only remaining records, would prove that the lie was true. Can lies become truth? Could a media system controlled by a few global corporations with the ability to overwhelm all competing voices, be able to turn lies into truth. These corporations are not answerable to the people. Only the politicians can regulate them. Corporations possibly buy politicians with campaign contributions. Contributions so large that the politicians would allow unregulated corporations to go about their business of eliminating less powerful voices until only one voice remained. One truth. This documentary actually started 20 years ago when I was in graduate film school. It was around the time of the hostage crisis it seemed to me at the time that the way the news was being covered was changing and that this was typified by Rupert Murdoch's New York Post. So I went and I interviewed the editor of the New York Post on video, very primitive video. Do you think that uh, you people increase public panic sometimes about shortages? Yeah, I, yes, I, actually I think that's where, it's, uh, that, that's where the panic starts, uh, through uh, the media coverage, through newspaper coverage, television coverage. Do you think that the New York Post tells the true story? Or? Well, sometimes you cannot uh, depend on the media. I think what they create is they create, like gas, you can create a panic, right? New York is a tough town, can be very abrasive. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I'm not a great believer in adding to anyone's anxieties. Peter Mitchellmore was quite candid with me that day. Later I found out why. Are you leaving? Yes, go on. I became rather incompatible with the uh, newspaper. <laughs> uh, the paper's fine, it's selling well, but it's not my kind of newspaper anymore. That's it. That day in 1980, we spoke about the hostages and the new phenomenon of the never-ending story. They were finally released the day Reagan was inaugurated. I didn't think anything of this coincidence at the time. Twenty years later, a series of extraordinary events took place. For me, they provided a window see the selling of the Iraqi war, the media's handling of the 2000 election, and the Supreme Court's decision in a new light. The question became whether there was a pattern in the way stories are covered and then dropped. Had it become easier to purposely manipulate the news? Were they not covering certain stories on purpose? 
Meanwhile, over the years, I had descended into the third world of independent film. But as it happened, right next to the review of my movie was a review of The Insider, a film about the killing of a news story. I took this as a sign. But how to get at the truth? I read about a man named Charles Lewis, an X60 Minutes producer who had created a unique nonpartisan news organization. The Center for Public Integrity broke the Clinton Lincoln bedroom scandal. He had also done a report on George W. Bush's SEC violations for inside trading. In the 60s, three in four Americans trusted their government. Today, it's one in four. Uh, Americans trust the government. The level of secrecy and the amount of money in our process is greater than it's ever been. Archibald Cox, a Watergate prosecutor I interviewed for our book, The Buying of the President 2000, said the level of trust in, in this country is worse than he's ever seen it, including during Watergate. People sense, I think, that the financial elites and the political elites have become one and the same and that the people themselves have no voice in Washington or in their state capitals, that they are somehow being left behind. When we think about democracy, in the United States, we oftentimes, and I think certainly in our media culture and our political culture, the assumption is that the type of democracy we have in the United States is the only type that could possibly exist. It's the high watermark of the human race is capable of, is U.S.-style democracy. In fact, though, I think we have both in theory and in many ways in practice um, a fairly, what you call a weak democracy. I mean, in fact, in many ways, we have a, a frighteningly weak democracy. There is an unfortunate sense as well of powerlessness, that there really isn't very much that can be done about the state of things. You can't have 280 million people and say that two political parties represent the, the thinking of 280 million people. Let's just, just think about that. If you are, just step, on, step back and look at that. And, you know, the thing is, is that anthropologists, they're going to dig us up hundreds of years from now, and they are not going to understand us. <laughs> no, seriously. And we've made a huge mistake inventing film and videotape because we're leaving behind a record of ourselves. We have a situation in which uh, a significant percentage of the population doesn't vote, doesn't care about the issues, uh, is tuned out entirely, is what we call depoliticized. Uh, in fact, we have a rate of depoliticization in the United States uh, that must make a tyrant, like in, you know, Indonesia, envious. They say, how can I get one of these vegged out populations? The, the top 1% that controlled 90% of the wealth had two major political parties doing their bidding for them. And the other 99% had no political party on the ballot representing them. And no representation in Congress representing them. And yet that 99% ran around waving little flags, going, we're free, we're free, we live in a democracy, woohoo! Oh, we're going to look like assholes. No, seriously, folks, we got to leave a note behind and explain our actions. We have more instant access to information as consumers and as citizens than we've ever had in the history of the country. That does not necessarily mean we're better informed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, the, that's a fascinating irony by itself. There's an apposite quote from Dr. Goebbels. That's a kind of an explosive you know, thing to invoke here. But he said once, and this is an example of how sly he was, that what you want in a media system, and he meant the Nazi media system, is uh, ostensible diversity that conceals an actual uniformity. The truth of the matter is, that increasingly what we see, what we hear, and what we read is being controlled by fewer and fewer large multinational corporations. People don't appreciate this. You know, in the last days of the Soviet Union, you had dozens of newspapers, dozens of magazines, all kinds of radio and television stations. The only problem is that all of that media was controlled by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union or the government of the Soviet Union. We are moving in that direction. There is an illusion of, uh, of choice that's maintained when you can have a hundred channels 
on your cable system and um, you know uh, how many movies did the studios release a year now um, all these different studios and the music industry with so many labels and uh, magazine stands that go on and on and on forever well that the owners are, are you know a handful five six different companies and that is a very dangerous development for those of us who believe in a vibrant American democracy fewer and fewer people vote when polls tell us that fewer and fewer people understand the political process, what the media does is trivialize what goes on, sensationalizes it, makes it entertain entertainment, rather than saying, look, the function of the media is to educate you to live in a democracy, which is pretty serious stuff. you got a media system that's basically a, a, a subsidiary of, of corporate America. That's all it is you're going to have a media system that will not cover uh, stories of tremendous public moment while it will overfocus on trivial stories that don't have any resonance at all. In terms of the political process, you ask yourselves, what are the most important issues facing our country? Why is it? Simple question. With all of the growth in technology, with all of the wonderful globalization and free trade, all of that stuff, all of the increases in education. Why does the average American today work longer hours for low wages than was the case 25 years ago? Simple question. Do you think it's seen on television very often? What about the morality of 1% of the population owning more wealth than the bottom 95%? See that? In a New York Times editorial, Princeton economist Paul Krugman addressed one of these little mentioned issues. According to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, between 1979 and 1997, income for families in the middle rose 9%. Income for families in the top 1% rose 140%. Krugman noted, quote, I know from experience that even mentioning income distribution leads to angry accusations of class warfare. He then asks, why has the response to rising inequality been a drive to reduce taxes on the rich? Good question. According to Joan Didion, news is no longer just reported but managed in a way that sets its terms and shapes its overall content. Has the mainstream media become an anti-democratic force in the United States? What you want to say is, if you have a self-governing society, a democratic society, what does that society need from its journalism? I mean, what, are, what are the attributes you need to have from your journalism, from your media system to produce, so that people can govern their own lives effectively? And I think there are you know, two or three things that jump out at you if you study the matter at all. And they're really not debated. Uh, one, you need a really hard watchdog. You need some, a journalism that keeps track of people in power and people who want to be in power. Hitler says in Mein Kampf that the people's power of forgetting is enormous. This is the case with mass society, right? You have to have a healthy media system in order to counteract that natural tendency. You've got to have that, because then people will be sufficiently roused by the notion of having to protect their interests to pay attention. Otherwise, if it's just a spectacle, you know, if it's just a bunch of razzle-dazzle and bullshit, people will naturally, you know, forget about it in a couple of days, and that's, that's the that's the pickle that Americans tend to be in. A CNN Gallup poll conducted in March 2003 found that 51% of the American people thought Saddam Hussein was personally responsible for the September 11th attack. Why did they think that? Forget about forgetting. They don't, they don't know. They don't know. I picked up my local paper today. Yesterday, yesterday there was a vote in the House of Representatives which would have provided, which passed, which would, if it carries into law, provide hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to a handful of families in this country. It wasn't mentioned in the newspaper. The repeal of the estate tax. Half of the benefits of that repeal will go to the richest one-tenth of one percent of the population. All of the benefits will go to the wealthiest 
2% of the families in America. You got that? 98% of the families do not pay one nickel in estate tax. I walked down the street a couple of months ago. Guy goes up and he says, Bernie, I'm really angry at you. You know, why are you angry? I've got $20,000 in the bank, and I want to leave my money to my kids, and why are you stopping me from doing that? $20,000. Guy's not going to pay one penny in estate tax. People don't know that. So what they do is they poll. They've got very good pollsters. And you play off the general ignorance of the population. People don't know much. Death tax sounds pretty good. Everybody who dies, you've got to pay a huge tax to the federal government. Not true. We put the death tax on the road to extinction. The death tax is a bad tax. And yet that 99% ran around waving little flags going, we're free! We're free! We live in a democracy! Woohoo! Your job is if you're at the network, to cover the basics. The basics mean that government, the entire federal government with millions of employees, is boiled down to the White House and the Capitol. You have a reporter at each place, and they're on every night. And that's, that's the extent of your federal government news coverage. It's idiocy. Shocking. It's shocking, and it's pathetic. And so you can have an SNL scandal that goes on for years, and no one notices it, because that's an obscure... Uh, now defunct agency called the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. Well, how many reporters do you think are down there covering that? Hardly any. If a member of Congress uh, gets an appropriation for $58,000 in order to, to uh, put some funding into a house or something or into something in his community, it's liable to make the front pages. Congressman Jones gets pork, $58,000 for this stupid project. Headlines. But when you spend hundreds of billions of dollars, it is more likely that the hundreds of billions will not be covered than the 58,000. How did journalism get this way? To remove controversy uh, from story selection, so you can't be yelled at for why did you put this in the front page and didn't cover some other story, there becomes a tremendous reliance upon official sources as the basis of legitimate journalism. This was a new thing. You know, in 1875, if the governor said something wacky, a newspaper editor said, I'm not going to cover that. It was stupid. Newspapers, um, they don't invent stories. They go to people, experts in this country, uh, for their opinions on what's coming down or not coming down. It means those people in power, uh, political power especially, but also business power, are sort of the assignment editors of journalism. What they want to talk about becomes news. What they, if they agree that they don't want to debate something, like the CIA, it's virtually impossible for a journalist to introduce that as a story. If the media had been on the job during the 2000 election, for example, if they had reported what was actually going on and reported it with all due emphasis and uh, repetitiousness, kept on the story day after day, I don't mean the occasional piece on page 10 of the New York Times, I mean appropriate coverage where you follow the scandal. If that had happened, uh, Bush Cheney wouldn't be in the White House today because they weren't elected. He stole the election. The range of inquiry by journalists was strictly determined by what the official sources were saying. In this case, the Gore campaign and the Republicans, the Bush campaign. And journalists basically, their credible journalism volleyed between these two positions. Now, the problem with that was very simple. The two sides were playing by very different rules, very different game plans. On one side, you had the Republicans, and they were committed to winning this election no matter what. Principle be damned. They were taking power, period. That underscored everything they did. So there was no commitment to being principled whatsoever. One day, if you got the right ruling by the state Supreme Court, it's clearly a state issue. The ruling two days later goes against you. The exact same people say it's clearly a federal issue. There was no sense of shame. The point was you wanted power, period. And it was an extraordinary propaganda effort by the right because you couldn't even find a Republican dog catcher in Idaho who would disagree. Everyone barked out the exact same line every day. It was uh, Joe Goebbels would have been impressed with the lockstep in which the Republican machine marched in their eagerness to take power and take this election. The problem was for those of us who just think whoever gets the most votes should win and wanted a fair election, the journalism didn't reflect that interest. It was a prisoner of that range of debate, and therefore it played directly into the hands of the Republicans. The BBC reported that five months before the 2000 election, Governor Jeb Bush moved to purge 57,000 people from the voting rolls, supposedly ex-felons. 
the great story that was broken by Greg Palast from, uh, from Britain, uh, which has now been confirmed, on the, for the first time, the use of, uh, by Catherine Harris of this private company to come up with a list of felons who wouldn't be permitted to vote, which was a dreadfully bogus list of thousands of people who weren't permitted to vote uh, who should have been. According to Palast, a private firm with Republican ties, Database Technology, signed a $4 million contract to provide scrub lists of ex-felons. Part of the job was to verify the list, which the firm acknowledged was inaccurate. The state of Florida brought in this Republican firm on the excuse that they had these databases, and when the company said, well, now we want to run the databases against this list of 57,000 names, there's a little handwritten notation that says, in Catherine Harris's office, right on the, the listing of the database checks, it says, don't need. <laughs> We will give you what they told DBT. We will give you the check if you don't check. How many of these names are wrong? Statistically, one in 20 people on the list may have committed a crime. So 95% of the people on the list, 95% of the people on the list, are kind of innocent. <laughs> Now, when I say kind of innocent, see, 54% of the people on the list are unequivocally guilty of being black. Now, you do the arithmetic, okay? 95% of a list of 57,700 people, 54% of them black. Catherine Harris certified the election of the President of the United States on the basis of a plurality in Florida of 537 votes. You do the arithmetic and you tell me what happened in that election? Palast, uh, when he first broke it, uh, CBS News called him up. And CBS News uh, said, yeah, we might want to work on this. And Palast said, well, go ahead and follow up on it. You can have it. And nothing happened for a couple of days, so Palast called up the uh, producer at CBS News and said, why aren't you covering this? And uh, the producer said, and I'm paraphrasing, well, we called up Governor Jeb Bush's office, and, and he's, he said that it wasn't true, it didn't check out, so we're not going to go with it. We did not do any kind of frontal direct investigation of the media for 10 or 11 years, mostly because our, our information we put out with news conferences and things like that is disseminated through the media. So it would be, a, I, I mean, I'm being very candid here, it would not behoove me to investigate the media on a regular basis because none of the information would ever be reported and, and my organization would never be heard from again. And so I'm, I, I do, I'm not stupid, I do recognize that fact. But I have been getting so frustrated, and I decided it was time that we looked at the media. We had half a dozen people working for six months, and we investigated, and we found, of course, that the most powerful special interest in Washington today is the media. Lobbyists hire placeholders. These people line up first thing in the morning for spots in committee hearing rooms allocated to the public. A few minutes before the hearings begin, the lobbyists arrive. These guys have hundreds of lobbyists. They have nearly 300 lobbyists, paid lobbyists, and they're giving away tens of millions of dollars in campaign contributions, and they control whether or not a politician ever gets on the air all over America. That's power. Being successful lobbying at the FCC or Congress is as important to the bottom line as producing a movie that's a big hit. I mean, it's every bit as important. It's more important. That's the, you know, basically stealing stuff from government is the key. And this is where the media companies are extremely successful because they, unlike any other corporate lobby, have one thing going for them the others don't. They actually control the means by which the public can actually learn about these debates. You know, you, know, you can mention Exxon would love to have owned the media, or Philip Morris. So any debate over cigarettes has to go through them. 
They took members of Congress on 315 all expense paid trips around the world. And then you have the FCC regulating the broadcast for 1,400 privately funded trips. How's the FCC going to tenaciously, aggressively regulate the broadcasters when they're tr taking trips from them all over the world? Well, of course it's not going to happen, and guess what? It's not happening. The problem in this town is that a lot of the regulators that have been set up to protect the public interest have been captured by the people they're regulating, and that's been going on for years. It's not new, but it's outrageous. Regulators at the Federal Communications Commission uh, almost always, upon leaving office, go to work for the people they were supposedly regulating in the public interest. Beneath the reported story of greedy Enron executives is a story about the influence of money over government regulators. This is what has happened with the media companies. Had been well designed. Crazy, crazy Jane is dancing. Crazy Jane's the dancer. Crazy Jane's the dance singer. Pure wet on sorrow, off the rub tomorrow. Rupert Murdoch, you all know Rupert? Right. Rupert is one of the smartest and most dangerous people in this country. Rupert Murdoch is the primary owner of the News Corporation. In the United States, he owns the Fox News Network. But Murdoch's media empire is global. Among his many holdings is a satellite TV service in partnership with the Chinese. Just as he gave a huge book deal to Newt Gingrich, Murdoch gave the Supreme Chinese leader's daughter a book contract to write a biography of her father. Well, if I'm going to get my book published in your capitalist society, I have to find a capitalist to publish it. <laughs> Regardless of whether it's one of Mr. Murdoch's companies or not. The nature of what used to be considered a bribe has morphed into a quid pro quo, an indirect payment, and it's legal. We have massive problems with what is I call legal corruption all over America where the system has been gamed by various powerful interests and, and it's all disclosed, of course. Of course, no one reads it and the media doesn't generally report it. Don't get me started. Uh, and so, so this is a wink and nod exercise with rampant corruption and the American people kind of actually, in a very interesting way, viscerally understand that things are corrupt. I was a producer at 60 Minutes and uh, worked in network television for 11 years, ABC and CBS, 60 Minutes, and I was an investigative reporter for those places. And I quit one day. My story led the show. I quit because the idea of everything being simplified down to good guys and bad guys and, um, uh, you know, the formulaic infotainment thing was getting a little old for me. Uh, I decided that I didn't want anybody telling me what to investigate, <laughs> and I was going to decide myself what to investigate, and I was going to take as long as I needed, not two weeks, to solve a 20-year-old unsolved murder. <laughs> Today, you know, we're up to 35 people. It's knock on wood been very exciting, but that's how it got here. So. <laughs> You have this contracting of ambition about what should be covered and what the public has right to know about. The price of power in Washington, who really makes money and who really benefits from the decisions. What will pass for investigative reporting is though someone may get a hold of an early report from some committee that's about to come out or an inspector general's report that's going to castigate the secretary of this or that. And so you'll breathlessly go on the air and, you know, you'll say ABC News has learned or whatever the network is and, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll be out of breath and it's all exciting and you're holding up a report and it'll look like uh, the faceless minions that comprise the network, hundreds of them out there ferreting information out for you to serve the public. It's a complete bunkum, of course. It's, it's not happening at all.
The public would never know from the media that they spent $11 million to keep any free airtime provisions out of any legislation, successfully, by the way. Edward Fritz, head of the National Association of Broadcasters, called free airtime for candidates unconstitutional and an infringement on the broadcaster's free speech rights. You have reached the stage in American politics, and I'm not kidding you, where the issue is not a debate over ideas. You, know, you have a point of view, I have a point of view. Who should that person support? That's what democracy is about. The issue is whether ideas at all matter. You look like a nice fellow, nice wife. you have any kids? Yeah, two. Okay. <laughs> Why wouldn't I want to vote for you? One of the strange things about it is that politics is now presented in terms of politicians and not politics. I don't think the media are interested in politics. They're interested in politicians, which is a wholly different subject. Media corporations don't cover the news when it comes to politics anymore. Uh, the, the political news coverage in 2000 was half what it was in 96. 96 was half what it was in 92. The third leading source of revenue for the media today, broadcast media, happens to be political ads. So if you're a politician, the only way you get heard is with ads. In 1981, uh, the media was getting $80 million from political campaigns for ads. Today, they got the last campaign, they got a billion dollars. That's why you've got to have millions of dollars to run for office as a politician. You're either a millionaire, you're able to raise large sums of money all day, dollar for dollars, and that's who goes into politics. And you are complicit in this system. You're not going to rock the boat. You know, 98% of those who run for Congress, who run again, get elected, get reelected. We have a 98% return rate in Congress. Are you aware of this? Do you know, I looked up the statistic, the old Soviet Politburo, had a 92% return rate, all right? They actually have more turnover than we have in the U.S. Congress. Is that just the most embarrassing thought? Why do we do this? We've got to change these laws. We grant these monopoly rights to TV stations. They don't pay a penny to the people for getting these monopoly rights to TV frequencies. Then they turn around and sell time on the public property and, and make billions of dollars and destroy our political system. All the while, they, have, they pay off the politicians themselves to keep getting these monopoly rights. The corruption here is dreadful. The public is really at a loss. What do you do about that exactly? I'm, I'm not quite sure. I mean, you can, they're probably in a perfect world there should be a citizens movement about this people should be marching in the streets I mean in some ways we should be as angry about what's happened to our media as the Russians ought to be about what happened to their media now that would be seen as heresy inside the networks how dare you we covered stories all the time last week look at this story look at that story they, they would take issue with what I just said They'd probably call you an American they would call me on American and a bomb thrower and I probably won't be on any of their airwaves anymore after this interview Ten years ago, 50 companies ran the media in America. Now it's down to five to seven. Today, tonight, as I came down here, NPR was reporting on decisions that the FCC, under the control of Michael Powell, son of Colin Powell, who had asked about whether or not there was a digital divide in the world, said, I'm more worried about the Mercedes divide. I'd like to have one, but I can't afford it. That's the commissioner of the FCC, who is about to lift all the ownership caps on big media companies in an issue that is not covered in the media. Michael Powell was actually quoted as saying that he has no idea what the public interest is. The oppressor here is regulation. He actually said that. Michael Powell uh, and uh, Republicans in the office at the FCC, we were on the verge with our campaign of making major changes to the rules and the public interest obligations of broadcasters. The Federal Communications Commission had proposed rules that we pushed in this campaign I mean, uh, that hundreds of Americans in small communities, in large communities, pushed we were going to get rules that would make local broadcasters much more accountable to their interests. Uh, those rules were proposed once uh, Bill Kennard was out of office and Michael Powell was in office. Those rules went into a drawer. They were never voted on. 
Starting with Ronald Reagan, the holy grail of deregulation has been sold to the public. And the news media has largely ignored its disastrous results. Once the Reagan administration was done, there were more rules. But they called it deregulation. It's uh, almost this Orwellian use of language where you create new rules, uh, but the rules change because they benefit industry, and you call it deregulation. And you say deregulation, and people feel that's good because people like deregulation. People like fewer rules. They like, you know, depending on simpler, cleaner, you know, old Western rules. But it's a trick. It's not, it's not really what's happening. <laughs> I remember when I first went into television, I believe the FCC rules were, were very stringent about how many television stations a network could own. I think it was five. And, of course, uh, they had to be in different markets. And now... Uh, I know here in New York we're talking about a duopoly. That's the new word. You have the possible probability, it looks like right now, that uh, News Corporation will be the owners of The Post, Channel 9, and Channel 5 in the one New York marketplace. So, yeah, the regulations have eased considerably. The whole uh, ball game has changed, and precisely how that affects different people buying and selling different stations in different markets and how it impacts on the news, I, I, I don't know. In my view, there, there are tremendous effects that are almost entirely negative. There's almost nothing positive about it. First of all, it leads to the... These companies are so big, their political power grows exponentially. It's a democratic issue. It means that um, one viewpoint will come to dominate in most of the outlets that we um, use for knowing what's going on in the world. Many people are not aware that when you watch television, uh, you are watching a, a program produced by a large multinational corporation uh, that has enormous uh, conflicts of interest. General Electric and NBC is a perfect example. Um, how can we be sure we're going to get the kind of information we need to have about the nuclear industry, about um, defense contracts, and all of those things when NBC is beholden to this parent company? Why would they report on that? Of course they wouldn't. Why would ABC report on what's going on at Disney? They wouldn't. There's no point in it. Um, and it's precisely for that reason that those companies want to own television stations in the first place, so that they can keep a check on those sorts of things. General Electric has made it uh, a very p proud uh, part of their policies uh, that they are going to move jobs from the United States of America to China, to Mexico, any place in the world where they can get cheap labor. This suggests, obviously, that General Electric is deeply concerned about our trade policies. Over the years, General Electric has done its best not to pay taxes or to pay as little as they can in taxes, taking advantage of all kinds of corporate welfare tax loopholes suggests very strongly that General Electric has an interest in tax policy. Uh, General Electric is a major polluter. Therefore, they're concerned about weakening environmental policies. It's not obviously just uh, General Electric. It's the same thing with uh, CBS or uh, ABC. The conflicts of interest are enormous, and the result is that certain issues are talked about, certain issues are not talked about. In 11, close to 11 years, we've done more than 100 reports the reports and investigations about public servants screwing up or systemic abuses of the public trust by public officials almost always get covered. We're the ones that broke the Lincoln bedroom scandal about the Clinton White House. We, we've done a lot of this kind of thing. When we do those stories, they get covered and the media jumps on them, frankly. We have a news conference. We normally have 50 or 60 reporters, four or five cameras. But I have to tell you, when we've investigated corporations, for some reason, it just doesn't get covered. <laughs> what can I say? See the Business Week uh, cover a short while ago. The majority of Americans believe that corporate America is just one corrupt institution that needs to be reined in. In some ways, corporate power is treated like by our news media much like communism is treated by the Soviet press. You know, in the Soviet media, the bad commissar who didn't meet the tractor quota could be uh, skewered in the media. Pravda or Task could give the guy a hard time. But the system of communism was off limits. 
And in many respects, the occasional capitalist or firm that uh, might make a bad tire or bad seat belt can be skewered, but the system as a whole is always off limits. In my entire political life, not one reporter has ever come up to me and said, Bernie, you know, the average worker is today working longer hours for low wages than 25 years ago. What the hell are you doing about that? Why do people have to work 50 or 60 hours a week? Bernie, what are you going to do about the plants that are being shut down in Vermont where, where companies are moving to China? What are you going to do about that, Bernie? Never been asked to me. Why not? Because those are questions that the reporters are not allowed to think about. You want, in a sense, you know, people say, well, do you think, Bernie, that there's a conspiracy, that uh, Jack Welch is on the phone to every reporter for NBC telling them what to ask? Of course not. But what goes on, there's a framework of thought that you are allowed to have. And it goes from here, it goes to there. And everybody kind of has the same mindset. You know, this story plays, this is a lead because it, you know, it, it, it's, it screams. This is a, you know, everybody kind of has the same approach to it. Everybody knows about Enron and, and how uh, the guys at the top managed to cash out very handsomely while preventing the pensioners from withdrawing their money in time to prevent complete ruin, financial ruin. Well, I mean, there's a history behind this, you know. George Bush, who is, of course, a good friend of Kenneth Lay, cashed out in exactly the same way, uh, you know, as a major shareholder in Harkin. According to the Center for Public Integrity, George Bush served on the Harkin Energy's board and was able to realize a huge profit of $848,000 by selling his stock in the corporation. Harkin had concealed its losses by selling some of the firm's assets to a group of insiders and declaring a profit. Shortly after he sold, the stock price plummeted. He reported the sale to the SEC 34 weeks late. Bush was on the audit committee and the restructuring committee. He claimed he didn't know. I propose some tough new standards uh, on for corporate reform. Like you all, I took a look at I took a look out there and saw a problem. And the problem was we had some folks who were trying to fudge the numbers. <laughs> we had some people who decided they weren't going to tell the truth when it came to their assets and liabilities. The Harkin Inside Trading story was reported by the Center for Public Integrity seven months before the presidential election, but the mainstream media chose not to report the story. This represents a kind of insider trading. It's obviously epidemic at the top. In the 2000 election campaign, the mainstream news media hinted that Al Gore was a liar. At the same time, the press ignored or glossed over serious questions about George Bush. From repeated allegations that he had gone AWOL to inside trading. Is there a connection between Bush's avowed policy to completely deregulate big media and their see no evil news coverage? Call it a coincidence. You know, they'll cover whatever they damn well please and it's not going to get in the way of the bottom line. It's not going to cost a lot of money to produce. And it's generally not going to uh, upset the powers that be, of which they are a major part themselves. And that's where we are as a country, and it's really grim to watch. It's very depressing. Bush made millions of dollars as governor of Texas, and his father is now making millions of dollars as a worker for Carlisle, making millions of dollars thanks to the policies of his son. His son has all around him in the White House and throughout the government, all kinds of people from Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin's making out like a bandit because of the war on terrorism. Th this, is, this, this is a scandal of such magnitude, you know, that you'd think that the press would be thanking its lucky stars that it happened on their watch because it's such a great story. No, it's too big for them to cover.
We know what to do with someone caught misappropriating funds. But when confronted with evidence of a systematic attempt to undermine the political system itself, we recoil in a general failure of imagination and nerve. Gary Sick, an American diplomat, wrote a book called The October Surprise, in which he argued that the Reagan team seems to have uh, basically meddled in the situation to make sure that the hostages didn't get released before Election Day. Gary Sick was a member of the Carter administration and on the staff of the National Security Council from August 1976 to April 1981. According to Mr. Sick's congressional testimony, quote, in the course of hundreds of interviews in the U.S., Europe, and the Middle East, I have been told repeatedly that individuals associated with the Reagan-Bush campaign of 1980 met secretly with Iranian officials to delay the release of the American hostages until after the presidential election. For this favor, Iran was rewarded with a substantial supply of arms from Israel." End quote. According to Mr. Sick, low-level intelligence operatives and arms dealers are no Boy Scouts. End quote. Their accounts were not identical, but on the central facts, they were remarkably consistent. Because of my past government experience, I knew about certain events that could not possibly be known to most of the sources. Yet their stories confirm these facts. Again, quoting Gary Sick, From October 15th to October 20th, 1980, events came to a head in a series of meetings in Paris. Accounts of these meetings vary. There is, however, widespread agreement on a number of points. One. William Casey, Reagan's campaign manager, was a key participant. Two, Iranian representatives agreed that the hostages would not be released prior to the presidential election on November 4th. Three, in return, Israel would serve as a conduit for arms and spare parts to Iran. Quote, at least five of the sources who said they were in Paris in connection with these meetings insist that George Bush was present for at least one meeting. Three sources say they saw him there. Former President George Bush denied being in Paris. According to Sick, immediately after the Paris meetings, things began to happen. Iran publicly shifted its position in the negotiations with the Carter administration, disclaiming any further interest in receiving military equipment. Again, according to Sick, between October 21st and October 23rd, Israel sent a plane load of F-4 fighter aircraft tires to Iran in contravention of the U.S. boycott and without informing Washington. There was a congressional investigation into this claim. Eventually, it was grossly inadequate. It was a real whitewash. A lot of questions were never even entertained, much less answered. In 1991, a congressional committee led by Democratic Congressman Lee Hamilton declared there to be no credible evidence linking Reagan's team with a delay in the hostages' release. In two contemporaneous magazine articles, charges of an October surprise were discounted. According to Mr. Sick, quote, after listening to the evidence, one of the former hostages I spoke with said simply, I don't want to believe it. It's too painful to think about. Whatever the truth of the October surprise may be, what is undeniable is that the story is a career graveyard for journalists seeking to work in the corporate mainstream. If you read what uh, the hostages themselves had to say later in their various reminiscences of the experience, and you read some of the press coverage in depth, you, 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 you find that the Iranians who were guarding the hostages had their uh, stopwatches out. I mean, they were, they were waiting for a particular moment to let those hostages run into uh, the uh, field of vision of the photographers who were all there ready to take their picture. Do you agree with the statement? Whatever is regularly broadcast is the definition of what is news. Or do you have another definition? Um, <laughs> that is a good question because, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, it, if it happens but you don't hear about it, did it happen?
But by and large, on the right at least, media and concern about media is at the top of the list. Republicans and the right wing mobilize, they organize, they train people to be in the media. Uh, right wing foundations spend money on media programs, they fund and subsidize a media presence to create an environment friendly to the views of a real minority in our country by actual numbers. In 1971, Lewis Powell, a corporate lawyer, was two months from being nominated to the Supreme Court by President Nixon. He wrote a memorandum expressing his concerns about how consumer activists and progressives were infecting the general population with an anti-corporate bias. This treatise circulated among a number of wealthy industrialists. One of them was Joseph Coors, who in 1972 provided initial financing of $250,000 for the Heritage Foundation. So began the neoconservative movement to influence the media. What we've seen since the mid-1970s is that all the great conservative foundations have devoted almost all their money to ideological warfare. So much of journalism depends on who the source of the story is. And so you've seen the creation of these foundations or institutes in Washington, like the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, that basically are extraordinarily well-funded groups. Reclusive billionaire Richard Mellon Scaife funds many of the right-wing think tanks. He also underwrote the Arkansas Project, a four-year multi-million dollar effort to investigate President Clinton. What has happened is resident fellows at the think tanks are paid to create rationales for predetermined economic and political positions, much like it was done in the old Soviet Union. The truth of the matter is that billions of dollars are being spent to convince the public that their interests and those of the corporations are the same. first few times they employ one of these right-wing experts, they'll be called from the conservative American Enterprise Institute or from the conservative Cato Institute. But over time, they just drop that. And pretty soon, it's just from the Cato Institute. And pretty soon, it's just analyst. If you're a source and you can have, have someone weigh in on trade deals, on Supreme Court appointments, on tax bills, giving your perspective, if you've got a series of people who are, sound like they know what they're talking about of all sorts of degrees, you can really influence the news. Powell singled out commercial TV and the judiciary as areas to influence. TV because it shapes people's minds. The judiciary because many crucial decisions are made by the courts. We have always had an unrealistic view of our judiciary. We don't hold our, our judges and our judiciary in general to the same standards of reporting as we do the legislative branch or the executive branch. There's much less coverage. If the Supreme Court had done for Al Gore what it did for George Bush, I give you a 100% guarantee that I would have written the same identical book, The Betrayal of America. Five members of the United States Supreme Court committed, in my opinion, and I feel very strongly about this, one of the biggest and most serious crimes in American history when they stopped the recount in Florida, took the election away from the American people, and handed it to George Bush. And in a fair and just world, these five justices belong behind bars as much as any American white-collar criminal who has ever lived. The mainstream media, they don't even want to talk about what the court did anymore. Their position is, and they've made it very, very clear, the election is over with, we've moved on to covering other matters. Now, mind you, and this is not to defend President Clinton, but this is the same group, the mainstream media, who pursued Clinton not just day after day, not just week after week, not just month after month, but year after year. These five justices are ardent federalists, states' rights advocates, and they've said over and over again, we let state courts interpret state law. December the 8th, the Florida Supreme Court ordered a manual recount the recount started the following morning, a Saturday, December 9th, 8 o'clock. At that point in time, Bush's lead had shrunk over Gore to 154 votes. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Justice Antonin Scalia steps in with an emergency order supported by the four other justices. He said, we've got to stop this recount because if it continues, it could, quote, threaten irreparable harm 
to George Bush, unquote. So even though the election had not yet been decided, the incredible Scalia was presupposing that Bush had won the election, and any recount that showed that Gore had won would threaten irreparable harm to George Bush. Now, if that doesn't show that these justices were trying to steal the election for George Bush, what in the world would? We're supposed to believe as Americans that all judges have some sort of saint-like qualities, that they're not political in any way, and that we can't even discuss it. Justice Clarence Thomas's wife works for the Heritage Foundation, a very conservative think tank in Washington, D.C., that assisted Governor Bush in his transition to power. We don't look at their financial holdings. We don't look at the trips they take to conferences sponsored by ideological groups that want them to rule certain ways. The night of the election, November 7th, Sandra Day O'Connor's at a cocktail party in Washington, D.C. with her lawyer husband, John. Dan Rather comes on the air at 8 o'clock and announces that it looks like Florida is going for Al Gore. Whereupon O'Connor blurts out, that's just terrible. She was angry. She was upset. Uh, the Wall Street Journal found three witnesses at the party to confirm that story. Newsweek found two. Both the Wall Street Journal and Newsweek went to Sandra Day O'Connor for a comment. She declined comment. Eugene Scalia is considered, widely considered to be one of the most qualified lawyers ever nominated to the post. The ties that bind Scalia and Bush's lawyer Ted Olson, who argued before the Supreme Court, come together in the Federalist Society, a judicial group with close ties to corporately funded think tanks. Society members like Judge Sentel in turn reject media regulation. Conservative judges have ruled that constraining the reach of media corporations violates their free speech rights. If you read the First Amendment, there's no question but that free speech rights are rights that belong to citizens. They're individual rights. They're our rights. In the 70s, we started to get this new idea of uh, commercial free speech. This is a very, very peculiar notion, commercial free speech. Because what it, what it does is it casts corporations, uh, corporate entities, as, as, as persons, which they're not. I mean, they're not people. They don't, you can't find their graves anywhere, unfortunately. The First Amendment has been warped so that we understand it now as a way uh, to uh, essentially allow people who own media uh, license to do whatever they want to do with the media that they own, with the property that they buy. The First Amendment becomes a barrier to understanding our responsibilities in a democracy. Free speech, when you're talking about the media, it's just a uh, fundamentally um, disproportionate right. My speech is equal to and as free as the speech of AOL Time Warner when they have uh, this platform of access to the world that, you know, I mean, I'm one person. Somehow, the freedom to inform the general public has become the exclusive right of media corporations. Giving them uh, free speech rights was, was a perverse move. And in fact, it was the kind of thing that conservatives, rock-ribbed conservatives, had ruled out, uh, you know, as recently as the 40s. During the Clinton administration in 1996, behind closed doors, the rules of the airwaves were rewritten. In radio, all regulation was literally thrown out. Small independent stations were bought up. Localism disappeared. Companies like Clear Channel went from owning a few stations to owning over 1,100 and dominating whole markets. But something else happened. Under Reagan, in 1987, the Fairness Doctrine was eliminated. Radio and TV stations were no longer required to air opposing viewpoints. This is partially responsible for the rise of right-wing radio. 
all the time from coast to coast. The vice chairman of Clear Channel is Tom Hicks. In 1998, Mr. Hicks purchased the Texas Rangers baseball team in a deal that made President Bush a multimillionaire. Clear Channel banned Dixie Chick songs because the lead singer criticized the president on the run-up to the war. A famous middle-aged rock and roller called me last week to thank me for speaking out against the war, only to go on to tell me that he could not speak himself because he fears repercussions from Clear Channel. They promote our concert appearances, he said. They own most of the stations that play our music. I can't come out against this war. Why didn't we find out more about that bill before it was passed? Well, because who's going to report on it, the media? According to Bill Moyers, during the Senate debate, Senator John McCain said, you will not see this story on any television or hear it on any radio broadcast. Altogether, the three major network news shows aired a sum total of only 19 minutes of coverage on the Telecommunications Act over the course of nine months. When a consumer group called the Consumer Federation of America got some money from the long-distance phone companies who were also, for their own different reasons, opposed to the bill, they tried to buy a 30-second spot on CNN saying that this concentration of power in the hands of a few companies would cause cable TV rates to go through the roof and phone rates to go up and CNN would not even accept their money. They wouldn't even let a consumer group, a dissenting group, buy, it, buy their way in to the story. Each time a new communications technology has emerged, a few companies soon gain total control over it. Will this happen with the internet? Well, up until now, the internet has been governed by a system requiring open access. The telephone network uh, on which the dial-up internet is based has been a common carrier, has been open. So anybody could have a website, anybody could transmit anything, and you could have all kinds of companies competing to provide you with internet service. Open access is being replaced now by a system of closed access. Companies like AOL Time Warner and Comcast and Paul Allen's Charter, they're opposed to any kind of open access rules. They say, we want to control internet delivery. I'll tell you something that I remember in the late 70s, that there were all these people who were like cable television as panacea. It reminds me a little bit of Oh, the web will solve every problem. We'll have a level playing field where your new website will be able to compete with Disney and Murdoch and Viacom's new website. No. Michael Powell has ruled that the cable companies are not subject to the open access rules. The future freedom of the Internet is in doubt. You know, one of the myths of our society, you've probably heard this one, is it's based on competition. Have you heard that? That's, see, that's, that's, that's the sort of pablum they feed us in the bottom fish. The truth of the matter is at the top of the system, the key to the system, is crushing competition. So what we've seen in media, in all the sectors, you've had fewer and fewer companies. The largest companies buy the small companies. They try to get bigger and bigger and make it harder for new companies to enter. Because once you have just a handful of companies dominate an industry, the ability for someone to enter the industry as a newcomer is almost impossible. I think there are lots of ways that you make news more profitable and it doesn't mean it doesn't make for better news if you ask the reporter are you interested in truth of course they'll all say yes If you go to journalism conferences which I do quite a bit of 
Everyone is looking for the truth. The problem is the gatekeepers of truth are not the reporters, they're the owners. And they're the um, lackey editors who work for the owners. And they'll decide what flies and what works and what pays the freight in terms of the advertising and the numbers. They'll be watching those numbers, and those numbers better be up or they'll get a new anchor. The thing that, that you know, that, that we base our, you know, our coverage, is it a good day or is it a bad day, is the numbers. I mean, I wish, you know, I wish we didn't have to rely on that so much. I wish, you, you know, there was some way that, you know, you could base, you know, your job or, or a performance on something other than the numbers. Unfortunately, that's not the, the climate right now. You look at, at news directors who get hired, because they, those are the ones that, that are really on the chopping blocks. They, I, I, mean, I think their jobs are less secure than Major League Baseball managers. That's not news. That's marketing. That, I mean, that's something else. I, I never heard of doing news based on going for some demographic. You do the news. <laughs> Call me crazy, but that's what you do. You investigate something because it needs to be investigated or someone's clearly lying or there's some issue of the public trust that needs to be looked into. You don't do it because you think some demographic will particularly enjoy the story. I mean, that, that's nutty. And it's the underlying theme of all the great laments we see, of all the journalists you talk to now. We're so appalled that the public service they entered has become a purely commercial activity. Bum, bum, bum. A pundit is defined as a learned person. According to James Fallows in his book Breaking the News, pundits are celebrities telling us what to think of events. Howard Kurtz, the media reporter for CNN, said, quote, The culture of news has merged with the relentlessly glitzy world of entertainment, producing one great roaring ooze of headlines and hype. Margaret Carlson of Time Magazine said producers want people who can sound learned without confusing the matter with too much knowledge. I'm perfect. Jeff Greenfield of CNN said, We're booked as entertainers. We know what we're being paid for. We are being paid to fill seats. FaceTime on television translates into big-time lecture fees. According to Brian Lamb of C-SPAN, the message from Washington in the last 20 years is that everyone does everything for money. George Will said, if you pick your audiences carefully, you can give the same speech every time. McLaughlin said, it's important to go on the road, where you'll get to hear the whole range of views from the trade association. These speaking engagements are usually given to business and trade associations and paid for by corporations. It's the whole essence now, almost, of uh, selling some sort of regressive policy, like getting rid of Social Security or environmental regulations, is to dress it up in some name to suggest just the opposite. So if you're going to try to get rid of environmental regulations, you call your group Save the Environment. Uh, the, you know, that's the name of the group that's trying to get rid of the regulations. When Reagan vetoed the Fairness Doctrine, he said it was inconsistent with the tradition of independent journalism what Orwell would call uh, the politically euphemistic language uh, that is used by everyone, by politicians, but also by news anchors. We live in an era now where uh, media has become so used to accepting the spin and accepting the structures that they are given that they don't cover news anymore. Can lies pose as truth? Winston had a friend at the Ministry of Truth named Syme who was sure that they could. His job was to eliminate words. The aim was to narrow the range of thought by eliminating words that make real thought possible. There would only be good and evil. Everything that Big Brother represented was good. Everything that opposed Big Brother was evil. As Syme explained to Winston, the whole climate of thought will be different. There will be no thought as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not thinking. One of these days, thought Winston, Syme will be vaporized. He sees too clearly and speaks too plainly. One day he will disappear. You heard that 175,000 votes were not counted in the state of Florida. But it's not like everybody's vote counted or was not counted the same. The number of votes not counted was in direct proportion, county to county, to the black population of the county. 
So how could it be that, for example, in Gadsden County, 52% of the population is black and one out of eight votes was not counted. One out of eight. Whereas in white counties like Citrus, almost all white, only one in 200 ballots was voided. How did this happen? And I go down to Florida. I go to Lehigh County. But we're all looking at chads, you know, the guys looking at the hang of chads and all that. And they, they make it sound like it's this big mysterious deal checking the ballots in Florida. Most, a big hunk of Florida votes by paper ballot, which is read by machine. You know, if you ever took like the SAT and you use those number two pencil, you stick it in the machine and they read. It's an optical reader. So they had a practice voting machine set up in a supervisor's office in Tallahassee. And so I voted, took out my pretend ballot, and I voted for Nader, and I voted for Buchanan. And I stuck the Buchanan-Nader ballot into the voting machine. And it came back. I stuck it in again. It came back. I said, oh, OK, wait. I'm trying to vote here, and it won't take my ballot. He said, of course not. You marked it for two candidates. You made a mistake. He won't accept a mistake on ballot. I said, what do you mean? All those votes were, were voided in Gadsden. Now, Leon County is a white county. Tallahassee, Gadsden's right next door to Black County. He said, oh, well, see, there's this switch. And in the black counties, like Gadsden, the same exact machines were set to accept ballots with errors. They would accept, you make a mistake on your ballot, very easy to do on a paper ballot, like you circle a name instead of check it off. The ballot's accepted, it's voided, your vote doesn't count. And in more of the white areas, it was set on reject so that if you made a mistake and you voted, it came back to you, you were given a fresh ballot, and you got to vote again. And the losers in this were the American people, whatever your political views, because we all have a right to have the person actually won the election take power. We all have the right uh, to there be a fair count. Helen Thomas, dean of the White House reporters, was quoted as saying that Bush is the worst president she has covered, the worst president ever. At President Bush's pre-war news conference, for the first time in 40 years, Helen Thomas was not allowed to ask a question. She had disappeared. A chill wind is blowing in this nation. A message is being sent through the White House and its allies in talk radio and Clear Channel and Cooperstown. If you oppose this administration, there can and will be ramifications. In the last several years, media corporations and politics have merged in a new way. Murdoch is a brilliant man who, what he has done and has had a tremendous influence in the worst possible way on culture and on media uh, in the United States and throughout the world. And what he does, he does it in England and he does it in the United States. His shtick is appealing to working class people and taking them to the right. And he does this through violence. He does this through super patriotism. He does this through sensationalism. So what you have now, and I'll give him credit for this, Fox Television is the first major network that has no pretense. I mean, CBS and NBC, they have a pretense to objectivity. Rupert Murdoch's Fox News Network is run by Roger Ailes. Ailes was the executive producer of TV for Richard Nixon. He was a consultant to Ronald Reagan, and George Bush the first. Tony Snow, a host, was a Bush speechwriter. The anchor, Britt Yoon, contributed articles to the ultra-conservative American Spectator. The phrase fair and balanced is repeated incessantly, like a mantra. Fair, balanced. Kerbal said, if you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it. All of their uh, talk shows are controlled by extreme right-wing Republicans. And it is a front for the right wing of the Republican Party. John Ellis, the head of Fox's election desk, Jeb and George W. Bush's first cousin. And it's notable that on election night, the first network 
to declare that George W. Bush had won the presidency of the United States was Fox. And it was John Ellis who made the calculation and the determination that they should make that call. But it's not only Fox. At GE, the wall between journalism and politics was also broken. According to the Reuters News Service, former General Electric Chairman Jack Welch came into the NBC studio and insisted that the race be called for fellow Republican George Bush. All the while, an NBC in-house taping system was recording Welch in the studio that night. NBC refused to turn over the tape despite repeated requests from Congressman Henry Waxman. NBC President Andrew Lack claimed turning over the tape would infringe on the editorial process. Waxman replied, Mr. Welch is not a journalist. And we now know the studies show pretty clearly, they, as they understood, they lost the vote. If there had been a fair vote, they would have been out of power. Calling the election for George Bush that night set the tone for any recount scenarios. And the whole tenor of the coverage followed that. If you watch Chris Matthews, O'Reilly, Brian Williams, when is Gore going to finally give up? Another desperation measure by Gore. The assumption being Bush had won. Gore is just scra scrambling, trying to sneak his way in through some loophole. The irony is that as the corporate news media has moved to the right, charges of a liberal bias have become pervasive. This impression was created because the Republicans have an arsenal of on-air pundits, adept at polarizing opinion, and ridiculing anyone who disagrees. And they can rely on Murdoch-owned media assets. Some stories disappear. Others are repeated endlessly. Murdoch, in turn, gets his deregulation. A conservative pundit, Bill Salmon, has written a book about Al Gore's attempt to steal the election. I find out that the party launching his book will be full of lobbyists and pundits and decide to go videotape them. Funny thing is, these behind the scenes operators don't like to be taped. As the right got more and more of a toehold in, in, in the media culture generally, through the efforts of Heritage and Hoover Foundation and others, that myth became increasingly serviceable, you see. You could cow moderates, much less liberals. You could cow anyone who wasn't a right winger working in the media by constantly assailing them with accusations of liberal bias or by assailing them about a lack of patriotism. I'm Janine Jackson from FAIR, the Media Watch Group. Um, I thought you might like to know that the Heritage Foundation has announced that Jesus would support a war on Iraq. The argument is no longer made that news media are hard on Republicans and easy on, on Teddy Kennedy and Ralph Nader. That's not the argument. That argument is so ludicrous as it, would, it doesn't even pass the giggle test. The argument now simply redefines left to right entirely in ways that drop out core issues of class, core issues of corporate power. The media does not discuss the growing uh, you know, inequity between the rich and the poor and the disappearance of the middle class. I could go on and on and on. There is no evidence whatsoever for the claim that there's a liberal bias in the media. It's based entirely on a stereotypic view of the reporters themselves, many of whom may be liberals, probably they're centrists by now, but the fact is that their own personal views have nothing to do with what gets on TV. Winston Smith worked at the Ministry of Truth. His job was to alter past news stories so that the version of the truth given by the ruling elite was never contradicted. One of the most troubling things about the media's handling of the 2000 election came a year later. A consortium of major news organizations hired the respected National Opinion Research Council, called NORC, to inspect the 170,000 uncounted votes. NORC was not allowed to characterize its findings. 
the media companies did that. And the disturbing thing is that they hid the truth by distorting the Florida Supreme Court's actual ruling, which called for the counting of all votes where the intent of the voter was clear. According to the BBC's Greg Pallast, who watched the North County operation firsthand, one counter said, quote, it screamed at you. If someone circled Gore, exactly who do you think they wanted as president? The consortium did not comment on the exclusion of tens of thousands of clearly marked ballots, which the NORC data reveals. Instead, the consortium came up with a tortured analysis that showed Bush would have retained a lead under one method of counting, just the undervote. On December 24, 2000, on NBC's Meet the Press, the moderator, Tim Russert, said the following. Florida, Florida, Florida is over. The board is now retired. And that was pretty much the end of the mainstream news media's coverage of the Florida recount and the Supreme Court's decision to stop the counting of votes. Had Nicaragua had an election like this and the Sandinistas won, the very people who won the Republican election would have insisted that we not only invade Nicaragua, but that all the people who engineered the election be held for war crimes. They know that they're not there serving at the will of the American people. They know that they stole this election and they created this fraud by keeping African Americans away from the polls. They know this. And they know they have very little time to enact their agenda because they know that they're going to get the crap beat out of them next time. Forget what the media is telling you, okay? This guy ain't going to last, all right? And he knows it. They all know it. But if they would do this, if they would stoop this low to steal our White House, what else would they do? What else are they capable of? What else are they capable of? I want to know. So what we have here is not the sunlight of democracy, but the dark, ominous shadows of totalitarianism, despotism, fascism. In a curious footnote, over the next two years, the Voter News Service, which had called Florida for Al Gore, was to be revamped for the 2002 midterm elections. Suddenly, exit polls had become unreliable. Then, on election night 2002, they weren't used. There were vague statements by the mainstream news media. As it turns out, the major networks own the Voter News Service. My guess is that the Voter News Service got it right on election night when they called Florida for Al Gore. According to congressional testimony, at that time, the Voter News Service projected Gore winning Florida by 7.3%, the equivalent of more than 300,000 votes. The Voter News Service was the smoking gun. It had to disappear. Welcome to Computer Voting, the newest twist in our voting process. With no paper trail. Uncheckable. what everybody remembers is Big Brother. That's the cliche from 1984. Let me remind you of another part of the story. The leader realized that he needed the permanent war in order to frighten the people into giving up their rights. What happens when a group of people have unaccountable media power and can redefine the rules without being questioned. On September 25, 2002, as the United States moved toward war, relatives of the 9-11 victims spoke. 
this press conference was not on the evening news. My brother Jim Patorti worked on the 95th floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center and lost his life on September 11th. And one of the hardest things I had to do was to tell my parents that they would not be seeing their oldest son again. No one victim of violence or war is less or more important than any other. So my brother, who was seen as a type of collateral damage in some fanatics' eyes, is, his death is no more or less important than the collateral damage of someone in Iraq or Afghanistan. It's a leveling uh, commonality that we have in this people. And so for those people who are making decisions about leading us into this very dangerous era, they have an open invitation. They can come to my house over the holidays. My brother's birthday is right before Christmas. They can see what it's like to be around a family who's affected by war and terrorism. And we believe that this aggressive act, this unilateral act, will only inflame anti-Americanism that is already in the Middle East among Arab communities. It is a factor in leading fanatics to commit crimes against us like September 11th. And they're saying to America, look, don't use this as a basis to go to war. Without the sin, you, don't, you no longer have a democracy. You have a dictatorship. And that's what we're getting from the White House. Oceania is at war with East Asia. Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. Well, in the novel, of course, Oceania has not always been at war with East Asia. In fact, Oceania and East Asia were allies against Eurasia. But it, it suits the purposes of the inner party to make everybody think that the latest situation has always been the case. How is that any different from George W. Bush uh, constantly mentioning the horrific fact that Saddam Hussein gassed his own people uh, in, in 1988 at Halabja? How is it any different when at the time the U.S. actually had foreknowledge that he had uh, chemical weapons, knew that he had gassed his own people and did not protest back then. Saddam Hussein was uh, a darling of the Reagan and Bush administrations. The thing that is most amazing to me is the lying that goes on today. Um, um, you are now teaching, I'm not making this up, we are teaching damage control and spin. I remember in this country we used to call spin lying. Now we call it spin and we study it and we admire it. How to put out a line of bull and have it fly for more than 24 hours and then they high-five each other because they beat the other side if it's another party or it's another candidate uh, or it's another company if it's one company with another with their annual report or their quarterly earnings or this or that. Public relations has overcome our whole society. It's all PR. Commissioner Copps. Good morning. I strongly dissent to this decision because today the Federal Communications Commission empowers America's new media elite with unacceptable levels of influence over the ideas and information upon which our society and our democracy depend. At issue is whether a few corporations will be ceded enhanced gatekeeper control over the civil dialogue of our country 
more content control over our music, entertainment, and information, and veto power over what the majority of our families watch, read, and hear. Radio deregulation gives us powerful and relevant lessons. When Congress and the Commission remove radio concentration protections, we experience massive and largely unforeseen consequences. Diversity of programs suffered. Homogenized music and standardized programming crowded out local and regional talent. Creative local artists found it ever more difficult to obtain playtime. Editorial opinion polarized. Competition in many towns became non-existent as a few companies brought up virtually every station in the market. This experience ought to terrify us as we consider visiting upon television and newspapers what we have inflicted upon radio. Concerns about the degradation of broadcast content do not justify government manipulation of consumer choice. Degradation is just an elitist way of saying programming that one does not like. The decision allows the giant media companies to buy up the remaining local newspaper and exert massive influence over a community by wielding three TV stations, eight radio stations, the cable operator, plus the already monopolistic newspaper. The decision further allows the already massive television networks to buy up even more local TV stations so that they could control up to an unbelievable 80 or 90 percent of the national television audience. Where are the blessings of localism, diversity, and competition? I see centralization, not localism. I see uniformity, not diversity. I see monopoly and oligopoly, not competition. It would be anathema to the First Amendment to regulate media ownership in an effort to steer consumers towards other programming. Ninety percent of the top cable channels are owned by the same giants that own the TV networks and the cable systems. More channels are great, but when they're all owned by the same people, Cable doesn't advance localism, editorial diversity, and competition. And those who believe the Internet alone will save us from this fate should realize that the dominating Internet news sources are controlled by the same media giants who control radio, TV, newspapers, and cable. I refuse to pour one ounce of cement to support a structure that dictates to the American people what they should watch, listen to, or think. The public reaction against the proposed changes has been unlike anything the FCC has ever seen. Of the nearly three-quarters of a million comments we have received, nearly all oppose increased media consolidation, over 99.9%. Those commissioners voting in favor of the item signify by saying aye. 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 Those those opposed signify. Aye. The item is adopted. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. The list of well-recognized people and organizations who oppose all or part of the FCC's media ownership rules is one of the strangest list of strange bedfellows you'll ever hear. Opponents include Walter Cronkite, William Sapphire, the National Rifle Association, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the National Organization for Women, Senator Jesse Helms. And theoretically, deregulation is good, but it's not always the right way to go. In the shadow of the largest corporate scandals in the history of this country, the last thing we need is to have regulators with no teeth. I believe it appears to me so evident that the big interests were served here at the expense of the public interest. Would you not agree with me that today those who most aggressively celebrate your decision are the biggest economic interests in broadcasting in this country. Are they not the ones that are celebrating your decision? I have no idea who's celebrating our decision. You really don't? Are you kidding me? You say they're modest changes. Clearly they're not modest changes. When, when in nearly 200 cities, newspapers will be able to buy the television station, you say that uh, it'll promote more competition. Nonsense. The evidence suggests that is simply not the case. You say that there'll be few mergers and acquisitions. Of course, that stands logic on its head. And you say, the court made us do it. The court didn't make you do it. I mean, this is the, the old joke in the movie, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes?
Commissioner Abernathy, you said that uh, we were acting out of irrational fear instead of hard facts with respect to the issue of consolidation. Is there any uh, evidence that you see with respect to consolidation, particularly with respect to radio in recent years and also television that would suggest we have an irrational fear of consolidation? What you have to balance here is you have to balance the First Amendment rights of the licensees against the rights uh, of all the, uh, the public to have diversity, localism, and competition. The founders did not anticipate uh, the protections for commercial speech that we now have, and nor did they anticipate essentially the warp to uh, the sense of the First Amendment that has occurred really since the 1970s. We have to revisit the term. What did they mean? What were they talking about? They can't possibly have meant that there should be free speech rights for transnational corporations because there weren't any back in the 18th century. They didn't exist. They weren't thinking of that. They were thinking of the citizens of the democracy. Citizens have First Amendment rights to a diversity of antagonistic views. Media reform is something that is absolutely crucial. It is the primary issue. It is the most important thing. Nothing is more important because if we don't have a media system that we can use to get our word out, whatever our word may be, if there is not a viable democratic media system for getting that word out, forget it. You know, we're screwed. We're completely screwed. We need antitrust activity, okay? And, and that's a complicated thing, and it will require that we rethink the, the very basis of antitrust law, which at the moment is all economistic. We have to understand that the real reasons why we particularly need to look at antitrust in the realm of media industries is not, be, not for business reasons, not for economic reasons primarily, but because the content, the crucial content of the news is, is completely distorted by uh, uh, large commercial interests. Some reporters have compared George W. Bush to Ronald Reagan. I reflected back on the Post interview from 1980 and about the hostages. How often do major news stories get buried down the public memory hole while a lie is turned into truth? There's a window of opportunity now. Most governments, most countries have not figured out how to limit access to, them, to the Internet. And they've not figured out, and powerful companies have not figured out how to block information that is inconvenient or unfriendly to them or that they don't like off of the Internet. At least in this brief window that we have before they all figured out. Will history repeat itself? Will the public find out about the threat to the internet before it's too late? We're not in the clear here at all. I mean, this is not a straight shot here where we can just go ahead and do whatever we want. It's, it's complicated, but, but it's new, and there are some things we don't know about it and no one else knows about it, and as long as there's a, is there the slightest bit of vagueness or the unknown element is, is something I'm going to exploit as much as possible. <laughs> Place, you're afraid.
need I look But maybe that's why you're for me again Cause you're ready to throw yourself to the wind